Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and welcome. Thank you all for joining us today and thank you to Airbnb. Um, I wanted to have this discussion to help young adults like myself to learn the best way to navigate difficult conversations and to have direct impact on our future. And I thought that I would bring an expert along. So please help um, Please help me welcome Dr. Atiba Goff. Hey, doing, man. How you doing, bro? Thank you so much for being here today. No, it's good to be building with you. I appreciate you having me on. I really appreciate it. Before I jump in with you, I do want to go around the room a little bit and let everybody that's participating today um, to kind of go around and introduce themselves and um, talk to us about why they wanted to uh, join this today. So, yeah, any of you guys can start. Yeah, I suppose this is Max and uh, Tamosha. Hi, so nice, to, uh, so nice to be talking today. Uh, Tamosha saw this like advertised in a hype beast article, and it was just kind of like, we just we just love what you do, your activism, yeah. your role in like bringing uh, Gen Z to the forefront as as change makers. Um, and like my last four years of, of college have been spent like operating around the environmental and political activism space, as well as uh, creative enterprise and, and working with artists and other activists. So everybody in the call today are different people that I've met along my journey as an activist or artist. Um, and we all just kind of were really eager to, uh, to hold this conversation and, you know, just really glad to, to share this space. Thankful for the opportunity. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you guys for being here. I really appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah I what, can go um, ahead and introduce myself. Hey, um, I'm Sasha. I'm calling in from Montreal and Quebec. I'm actually a friend and co-workers of Max. Um, we work for an organization called Force of Nature that works on talking to young people about how they can kind of process their feelings of anxiety and really figure out how to articulate um, kind of what they want to do in the world and really like come into their own niche and space. Um, coming from a place where I firsthand have struggled with difficult conversations with family members and with kind of trying to find a common ground with people, I think we're at a turning point where we need to start working together towards efficient solutions rather than at cross purposes. And I feel like that happens so often. Um, so I'm just really excited to join today and hear what you guys have to say. Thank you so much for having us. No, thank you for coming. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, hi, my name is Evan. I'm a senior at Michigan State University, just studying environmental sustainability. I got invited through Max. Oh, shout out to Max. Uh, best bro since I don't even know when. <laughs> uh, so I'm, again, very excited to learn more about what we're going to be discussing today. Uh, right now, I'm currently doing research on plastic bag perception at Michigan State University with Dr. Julie Labarkin. So again, I just want to understand uh, more about how can we bring the conversation to the forefront when it comes to, uh, between being Gen Z and again, just notifying and actually acknowledging that we need to, you know, upbring, do better, uplift each other in these difficult times. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for joining with us. Um, Alex, you I... wanna... Oh. Go ahead, Vita. No, go ahead, Vita. <laughs> Sorry. Um, hi. Uh, it's really nice to meet you all, and it, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Vida, and I was also invited by Max. Um, and uh, Max and Sasha are my soon-to-be co-workers, so I'm really excited um, at Force of Nature. And I'm currently in France right now, but I'm originally from Canada. Um, and the school that I'm currently at, Sciences Po Paris, is um, a very very diverse school politically, uh, political thought. There are some very strong thinkers and myself coming from a background of, um, of immigrants. Um, I've, you know, the past summer has been a really, really big turning point in terms of mentality and reevaluating my relationships. And um, I think today is a great opportunity for me to be able to hear from a variety and diversity of thinkers and, and thought leaders and such amazing people to hear how we can really confront these topics and really engage in genuine conversation to make change, uh, not just conversation for the sake of conversation, but conversation to really uh, take proactive action and change things. Thank you for having us. Of course, thank you. Uh, I'll go. Uh, I'm Alex. Uh, I come from more of a, an art and fashion background, um, but both my parents are conservation biologists. Uh, so environmental activism and sustainability has been really important to me for a long time. Um, so just like everyone else here, I'm very passionate about the environment and look forward to talking about how to, how to uh, be more active in, in talking about that with more people as well. So thank you again for, for this wonderful opportunity. And thank you, Max, as well. No, thank you. 
Okay, I can go next. Um, so, hi, my name is Karina. Um, I currently live in Detroit. I'm actually um, from Texas. Both of my parents are um, immigrants, and um, Max um, Offerman was so kind to invite me to this. Um, but I have been doing a lot of um, racial justice work over the years, um, trying to get you know a lot of young people involved, um, trying to educate people on you know the matters that are going on right now. Um, and it's it's an honor. <laughs> thank you for having me here. No, thank you. Hey, hey uh, my name's Jack. I'm a graduate of Michigan State University, so it's cool to see some familiar faces here. Uh, Max reached out to me about this event. Super cool, just kind of heard about it yesterday, but it seems like a really important conversation to be having. Uh, I'm up in Spokane, Washington right now. I'm actually an AmeriCorps service member. Um, I do all my work in the field of education, and that's kind of where my focus is at, is uh, expanding access to education and education to create sustainability for the future. Activism needs to happen through you know, youth, I think that's such an important thing. So this is an awesome conversation to be having. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for coming. I, sorry, I haven't <laughs> introduced myself. Um, yeah, Jaden, like, I see you. I mean, I haven't met you yet, and this is the first time interacting, but you're someone that embodies our generation and how we need to shift our just everything we do needs to shift towards um purposeful action and deliberateness and um being uh, uh just thoughtfully you know living your life with intention and with all these problems arising um the youth need to be inspired as a collective and that's how we're gonna you know actually push this forward this change um i don't know but i really am inspired by yourself um and yeah and uh i'm a clothing designer uh and i specialize uh i work with uh max here on piecewear and which is essentially um a modular alternative to sustainability in the fashion industry uh, to radically reduce waste and um, and pollution uh, as a result of production. So, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, is that everybody, or is there? I I have one friend. I just shot him um, a text. It looks like he he's joined in here. He just doesn't have his uh, his video on. Vince, if you wanna. You want to chime in if you can hear me okay and then i had one friend who funny enough um is still canvassing uh given that the election is next week next week his canvassing went on a little bit longer than he planned for today um so he won't be able to make it but you know oh, at least it's for a good cause no problems well i just kind of wanted everybody to go around and kind of get a feel for everybody else that was here and um I would love, Dr. Goff, if you could kind of explain what it is that you do and what your work is um, so that everybody else can have a better understanding of that. That would be amazing. Sure. Um, so like I said, it's, it's good to be building with you again, Jaden. Um, uh, my name is Philip Atiba Goff. I am a professor at Yale University in African-American studies and in psychology. Uh, my background is in social psychology and social cognition, but really I'm a, I'm a data scientist. And the way that Jed and I get, got connected is I run a nonprofit called the Center for Policing Equity. At the Center for Policing Equity, what we do is we work in collaboration with community inside of public safety systems to make them less racist and less deadly, and then outside of public safety systems to make public safety systems smaller. Right? People, it's a hard thing to argue, even in the midst of all of, all of this mess we've got, that people aren't safer when they don't have to call the police in the first place. And it's a hard thing to argue that when people are in crisis, you should send tools that don't help them with their crisis. And it's not always a badge and a gun. If I'm homeless, my crisis requires a roof and four walls, not a badge and a gun. So that's what we do. You can think of us as sort of serving this, uh, I call it the Issa Rae principle, like we're, we're rooting for everybody black, but also brown, 
and also queer and trans, right? But with public safety systems so that they can define for themselves what safety means and they are empowered to enact that. I'm just happy to be sitting here talking to folks. I'm glad that folks who are the age of my students are still interested in talking to me outside of class. Of course, of course. And I'm so glad that you could be here. Um, Dr. Goff also came on to my show with me, Solution Committee, where we talk and we bring a lot of youth activists on to talk about a lot of different social problems in the world. And, you know, I'm Jaden. Um, I make music. I make movies sometimes. And I like to create change in the world. You know, um, I started a company called Just Water that's an environmental company that happened a long time ago. And I have a company now called 501c3 that targets communities that have been impacted by environmental racism in a way like Flint, Michigan, not having access to clean water. And we go into places like that and we put water filtration systems and such in those types of places. And we actually just put one in Skid Row and we're working on the uh, video for that right now. Um, but Dr. Goff, I just want to dive in with you on the state of the world right now. And it seems like the conversations that we need to be having aren't happening. And how do you think that we got here where, you know, people feel like we can't have the conversations that we need to have, or we can't speak up for how we really feel in the world. I feel like this whole conversation is about um, being able to empower the youth to speak up for what they believe in and make their voice be heard. Um, and how do you feel like we got here right now where these conversations that we know that need to be happening are not happening on the scale that we want them to be happening? Yeah, it's a good question. And I would I just say that I don't think that that has anything to do with young people not feeling like they can speak. I think the mm -hmm. reason we're sitting here not having the conversations we know we need to have is because the folks who should have been having it 10, 15 years ago weren't having it with each other, right? Mm -hmm. There's no reason of it for, for young people. That, I was I was fortunate enough to be in the same room with uh, Greta Thunberg uh, in January, back before the quarantine and the mess. And there is no reason for someone who is still high school age to be lecturing people who are in their 50s and 60s who know about environmental science on what they should have been doing, right? Mm -hmm. Except that the people who are in their 50s and 60s weren't talking to each other. So one of the things I want folks to, to, to hear me say, it feels like we're in a historically different time than we've ever been in before. But that's not because young people and older folks aren't having the conversations and young people aren't talking. It's because old folks messed up. Mm. Because we are here because folks have dropped the ball and broke the things that were holding us together. Mm. So the most important thing about how we get out of here, to my mind, is to make sure that the folks who are coming into their own, who are, who are growing into their own power, understand that the world is only this way because someone who came before them imagined it should be. And that their imagination is at least as powerful as the imaginations that shape the world they're in. That doesn't mean you can just dream of a world where everything is clean and it happens tomorrow. You better imagine a plan and not just a utopia. But so long as folks understand that the power to shape the world is in the hands of the people with the energy to do it, those conversations, they're uncomfortable sometimes. They, they can be painful. They can sever relationships, but those conversations can happen and they can yield to actual behaviors. Wow. The way that you, the way that you speak is just so amazing, the way they articulate everything and make it all make sense. Um, what do you feel like we can do as a group to have a better outcome um, here? Before I start passing it on to the audience's questions, like what do you feel like as together we can the, the people that came before us, they dropped the ball. They messed up. They didn't do the right thing. How can we continue moving forward in a way where we can make sure that it doesn't happen again in the future and we can kind of try to fix some of and put together some of the broken pieces? Yeah, so I know we're supposed to be talking about how to have the hard conversations, but part of the deal is the conversations go way smoother when you've done some of the work. Right When you're not talking about the thing that you read or the thing that that person said and you found inspiring and why don't you find inspiring what I find. It's like talking to somebody about why they don't like the same kind of music as you. That's mm -hmm. not a great conversation mm -hmm. most of the time, unless they don't like Prince, in which case you need to educate them. Right? Like, I can't. Totally. Totally. Um, <clears throat> but, but if you're talking about how do we do on this, the first thing is exactly what I said. Know that your visions are powerful. You know, the most important thing I think anybody said to me when I was in college, I had an advisor who was this real big, famous dude, with big afro and everything. He was a real famous dude. And he said to me in a one-on-one -on -one meeting, he said, you are important to the things that you care about. Mm. That, I mean, that's still, like, I, I get chills in that. And he's like, because who is going to add your voice to the things that you care about but you? 
Like that's real. Like that's not that's not a hy- that's not hyperbole. That's not blowing smoke. That's a real thing. So that to me is first, and then second. Once you've imagined the place you want to get to, please don't stop there. Imagine a plan, right? Because it's one thing to say I want a world where everybody has access to clean drinking water. I want a world where everybody's voice um, uh, can be heard and valued, where people's identity don't have to be a fight with their family, where it is the affirmative assumption that that you go- grow up into yourself and that that's just beautiful. How do you do it? Take seriously the notion that you got to be expert in the processes that have created the mess that you're trying to clean up, right? And so for the folks who are, who you you like reading poetry and literature is your thing, go learn statistics. For Mm -hmm. the folks where math is your friend um, and you don't know like that that whole like stanza stuff and like long format, learn how to communicate. Learn the, the native language of the systems that are keeping things the way that they are. Because the most powerful thing other than a strong imagination is the slow grind of systems resisting change. So take that seriously. Take seriously that this is a long-term thing and that people have wanted to do right since well before you were born, from before your grandparents were born, and we haven't gotten there yet. So you are part of a very, very long arc. I had a fr- friend in college who said to me, you know, I don't want to lead the revolution. I don't want to stamp uh, with my face on it. I just want to sustain minor injuries on the correct side of the revolution. Like that orientation, that's that's some wisdom there, right? <laughs> There's some wisdom in that. Yeah. That's some real wisdom, honestly. Yeah. Thank you so much for everything that you're sharing because, you know, I'm so glad that we were able to connect again because after um, we had our talk on the solution community. I could tell that you were the type of person that I would want to be able to stay connected with over a long period of time because I like the way that you think and I want the way that you um, think about these issues and go at handling them. I want that to like rub off on me because I really like the way that you go about it. So thank you so much for telling us um, about yourself and uh, answering those few questions for you that I had. And this is an interactive conversation. So I want to like anybody out there, if you guys have questions about what we're talking about and what's going on, I know that you guys might have some, please speak up and, and, and please ask away so that we can, we can get into it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And and Dr. Goff, you are such an amazing orator. Um, and I think so strongly what you're speaking to, to me, um, is speaking to vision, um, proposing a vision rather than counteracting something that's in place, but really getting down to it and proposing a new way forward. And I think so much of what we've seen within our generation um, and kind of my lived experience uh, in, you know, starting struggling with depression at 13, Right at a young age, without any real understanding of of what's going on here, and always feeling um, kind of having it framed as as what's wrong with me, um, not what's wrong with the world around me. But I always blamed it very inwardly, and you know didn't didn't feel like I could talk about it for reason X Y Z. Um, but I think many of us in this call, and then many in our uh, generation, are are waking up to this and feeling a stronger desire than ever to walk away from the system that we have. Um, but many people don't have a new vision to work toward. Um, and so how can we kind of start bridging that gap? And I know that this was kind of, how do we bring activism to the dinner table? But even with that, I wonder how much do we need everybody to change? Um, you know, and if we're, if we're really waiting for everyone to change, I think we're gonna be waiting for another 10,000 years. Um, so how do we really start instilling the sense of responsibility and ownership of vision within the next generation? within my generation. No. No. Oh, yeah. no, go ahead, Jen, go ahead, Jen. Okay, I, I was just gonna say that you're saying, how do we instill the, the vision to the next generation? I feel like it's so important, like Dr. Goff said that he had that one-on-one conversation with his professor that really impacted him, just how Dr. Goff is speaking right now and it's really impacting us. I feel like the first step of that is saying to those young kids, hey, we want to hear your vision. Tell us what your vision is. We want to know what your vision is. It's like empowering people to know that they can form out a vision and that their vision can be strong and that they can change the world with their vision. I would say that that would be the first step because even just Dr. Goff saying that and saying, oh, and talking about vision, it's empowering me to be like, wow, my, my opinion does matter. I do need to envision a better world. I'm not just wasting space in my brain. This is something that could actually help the world by envisioning a different, better future and actually 
taking steps in my life and dedicating my life to certain things to make those visions happen. Um, but Dr. Goff, what were you going to say? Yeah, no, and I'm, I'm so glad I get to go after because, um, you know, you've been saying such kind things to me. It's time for me to go ahead and pay that back. One of the things that y'all can do is find a way to live your life free. One of the things I respect so much about Jaden, what you have done um, in the shorter time you've had on earth is every public move you've made, you have found a way to be more free than the last time. Mm -hmm. Not constrained by what people expect for somebody um, of your age in your space to be like, um, not constrained by the kinds of weights that I know could be put on you from the outside. You choose to try and live free. And the thing that I don't ever get about myself, I'm, I'm my same 13 year old self, right? Like, I'm kind of awkward. I kind of have my friends. I have the people that, are, that I'm nervous to talk to. I am that same person 30 years hence. But the ways in which I choose to, to step fully into myself, that's permission for somebody else to do the same. We don't recognize the power that the person we choose to be can have in other people's lives. And so, Max, you asked about, like, do we need to convince everybody? I'm like, I, I so want that to be the conversation about Thanksgiving, right? I see you shaking your head no. Part of what I want people to understand is that when you have an argument, let's, let's assume that it's the sort of traditional um, Thanksgiving, right? And so you got extended family there. And the, and the argument is never with your parents. It's always with the uncle, right? That uncle's the, the father to somebody, but whatever, right? So like you're having that argument. Sometimes the argument is not for the sake of the uncle. It's for the sake of the nephew, right? Sometimes the reason you're doing that is to say, I have, my voice has power and I refuse for you to speak that way in my presence, right? And then at some point you got to say, all right, I can love you and disagree and I got to step away. And the other part of this is not at the table. It's what power we give and we take as we move towards the world that we want to see. Those things are not, they don't have to be the same. You don't just have power by who you convince, right? And for everybody who's listening to this, who's in high school, it is definitely not about who you're convincing in high school. When you leave high school, the whole world is a very different place. The, the folks who are, I'm seeing the, my dude who's in Michigan State right now, right? Whoever you were in high school, you, you are not that person today. And I know you are glad of it, right? So it, it's both who you can step into and how you show up for the conversation, even if you have convinced nobody, because your life and your views are powerful to people you don't expect. That's, that's such a good point. That's such a good point. I love the maybe the comp, maybe the argument is not for the uncle and it's for the nephew, right. because I feel like I've been that nephew in the room sometimes where one of my cousins is saying something or speaking up or doing something that I would do at my age now, and I'm being young and I'm seeing that and I'm like, wow, like that's how you handle that situation or that's how you respectfully place yourself, you know firmly just in your own skin you know what i'm saying you're like this is who i am and this is how i feel about the world and you know not letting people take that power away from you mm -hmm. so i really love that i'm going to use that i'm going to definitely use that um do we have any other questions from anyone about uh what we're going through what we're talking about yes yeah i would love to ask a question um kind of coming from the perspective of the dinner table i feel like in those hard conversations I've had, it's always struck me more and more how effective it is to know when to speak and when to push and then when to step aside and let other people speak for themselves and kind of when to pass on the torch, when to say, no, you shouldn't be hearing it from me. You should be hearing it directly from the people who are affected. Like, this is not my platform to speak from. Mm -hmm. And I think when I think about young people and moving forward and finding their power in the world, I think about how we have these ideas and these kind of metrics of success that we've been taught. Like, this is what it means to be successful. This is, this is what it looks like to do well in your life. And that works for some people, but that neglects that people are wildly diverse. And also that some people just aren't in a place where they can actually act on those metrics, metrics of success. So I guess my question around the vision would be, how do we teach young people to aspire to a metric, a metric of success they've never even thought of before? Like you can be successful in ways that we haven't even thought up or envisioned yet. Yeah, I think that that's that's a really interesting um, that's a really interesting question because you know I do feel like we have very interesting metrics of success or even the idea of winning and failure and 
what is that and how do we teach people to have different metrics of success i feel like that's important because a metric of success could be making sure that you know making sure that everybody is looked after you know like that's what success you know we can teach people that that's what success is making sure that everybody's okay that there's not certain groups of individuals that are treated completely unfairly or um not looked after in any way i feel like if that was a metric for success or if that's what success looked like for young people i feel like we would see a very different world or just you know so many people want to just win or be the best or be number one or be over someone else or I feel like a metrics of success should really be just to be happy and for everyone to be able to be happy and to have that, you know, evenness and fairness in, in kind of a world in the society. I feel like, um, you know, those types of different metrics of success are important because sometimes you can be like, oh, I want to win. I want to be the best or da, da, da. But then you can still be sad or not happy or the people that you care about and the people that you love can be being unheard or being treated unfairly. Um, so I do feel like we do need um, different metrics of success within society because sometimes being the best and winning and getting to the top and being above everyone leaves other people disproportionately affected in negative ways that can have really bad outcomes in a long term society. And yeah. I feel like we might be seeing a little bit of that. Um, yeah. So that that was a really amazing one, honestly. Um, For sure. I, and I. I I think that speaks nicely to intersectionality too, because it makes you realize that if you're not promoting everybody's rights and you're not looking at, you know, who is this reaching, but who is this not reaching, those things are gonna catch up in society. Like we can't, we can't promote the voices of a few and leave some behind and then expect everything to work out. There's one thing we've learned from COVID, I guess, it's that like the health of everyone is a global issue. Like everything is global health, everything is global sustainability. Mm -hmm. And it's about the, well-being of everyone, all of us, all boats rising with the tide and not um, disproportionately letting other people suffer, you know, in the ways that we have been doing historically in this country. So I do feel like a, a huge change is, is very necessary. And thank you for asking that question. I did see somebody else was raising their hand for a question um, if they want to ask that question now. Yes. So um, my question was, um, how do you prevent burnout? Just because um, for me personally, as a brown woman, and you know, with the pandemic going on and a lot of just in racial justice that we see um, around the world, I have been you know taking my part in just organizing, um, getting people involved. Um, at times, it has come to where like I've had to risk my life. Um, you know. And I've tried, you know, educating, having a conversation, creating a dialogue, um, whatever it entails, I've been doing it. Um, but how do we as activists prevent burnout? Dr. Goff, do you, do you have any anything for this particular question? It's, I mean, it's a great question. Um, I start by trying to normalize that what you're going through is not, you're not alone in that. Right. And then to go back to Sasha's question in terms of the metrics of success, like mm -hmm. in the same way, sometimes the life that will be the comfortable life or the life that allows you to, to realize the person you're trying to be, you haven't encountered it yet. In part because you've got to live it, but in part because you don't have to, you, you didn't grow up or you're not surrounded by people trying to do that. Um, I'm reminded there's some research by this guy named Doug McAdam that he, he follows people who do things like the Peace Corps and Teach for America and things like that. And it turns out like 20, 30 years afterwards, they're no more involved in um, sort of social justice and public service than the folks who did no service whatsoever. And it's not a diss to the folks who got involved. It's that doing that life has so few rewards baked in. You think about like you go into investment banking and the amount of money you make, you can give like less than 5% of your salary. And that is way more than the average salary of someone who's running a nonprofit. So we don't, we don't set up the systems to make it easy to do this work. And for so many of us, we do the work because it, it, we feel it in our bones. Like, how could we do anything other than that? We do the work because we can't live a life where we're not doing it. So of course you're going to get burned out. Like, I don't know if you've, if y'all have been in relationships where all you did was hang out with each other and make all your friends sick, right? That, that's that's not gonna last. That's no, gonna no. burn out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> right. I hate to tell you if you're in that relationship now. <laughs> I <think so>. uh, <laughs> and it's the same thing. If all you're doing is activism not broken up into a full life, then you are falling into that same trap where you have not supported the things that you care about with a life that can, can take care of it. So I mean, what, this is a lot of words to say self-care is a real thing and it's a revolutionary act and y'all need to be doing all that stuff. Um, but the reality is we have not created systems that support people who wanna do the right thing for a living. So you gotta think about a vision where that's part of what you're making, you're, you're making happen too. Not just the world you wanna see, but a life for someone who wants that world. Wow. That's so amazing. And just and just back bouncing off of what you just said, back to visions. It's like we have to include that within our visions. And so much of being able to have those visions is being able to have the information to populate the vision with, oh, I want things to be different like this. I want this to be different. Uh, and things need to be like this and like that. You have to have the information in order to have that vision. So if you ever feel like, oh, the vision isn't coming or I don't know how to put the vision together educate yourself because what Dr. Goff has just told me by educating me with every word that he says, it's now enhancing my vision that I have of the world or, oh, you're right. The world should make it easy for people that are running nonprofits. I, I have a nonprofit and I'm like, you're right. I have had to jump through, you know, burning hoops to just do simple things. And it's like, it should be easier for, for people who are doing, the world should be set up so that, you know, it's easy to be a good person and to impact the world and that you don't get that burnout because it does happen when you're just talking about what's going on in the world so much and you're just every day, you know, talking about this and demanding justice and still feel as though that you're still as unheard as, as ever when you know that you're making so much more of an impact than ever with the whole community and you still feel as though that the world is just still just, just not caring and not counting you in and it's, it's, it's sad, but I feel like that's a part of this conversation too, where it's like, hey, we have each other. We all have felt that. We all have been there. We've all, you know, had that. And like together we can get past that and we can get through that and we can grow together, you know. And um COVID is making it really difficult too, because you can't be with those people that might be on the same page with you. You know, it's like maybe me, me and Dr. Goff are, are vibe super hard when we're, we're together and we see eye to eye on so many things, but you know, we've never met. You know what I'm saying? Because of COVID, you know what I mean? So it's harder for people to really get in those clicks where you feel like, ah, oh, we all like, we feel each other. We all have that burnout. We all feel like this. We all do this. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's harder to feel like that and, and to have that interconnectedness because community, whether you're at a march, whether you're at a protest, that's so much of the community. You have your click when you're at the march. You have your click when you're at the protest. You have those people that are with you. You know what I mean? Or even in school when you're studying or anything. So you know, that's that's another reason that we wanted to have this conversation so that we could be each other's, you know, like click through this and have this conversation today and take this inspiration moving forward. We don't have that much time left, so I wanna if anyone else has any other questions, we can we can jump into that. I just wanted to say like, oh I just dropped. Um the idea of like um empowering the youth like redirecting the entire narrative of rather than, you know, being born and, you know, following this, like go to school, go to, you know, get this job, get this, you know, make sure you have your money down, make sure you have your house, you know, like this narrative um, of individualism and developing a life that's centered around self rather than, you know, you know, blossoming into a bouquet of flowers that starts to sprout and like you know channel through all these different people this idea of positivity and ingraining that into the youth I think is something that's overlooked I don't think you know from from a childhood it's always like Jaden mentioned earlier like it's competition it's like mm. you know I'm can I be Matthew and you know score three goals instead of like the two that you scored last game like it's always that competition and there's no love there's no like respect there's no um there's no pure like damn good for you like i love like that you're able to do that for yourself for your own personal development i think that i don't know i've i've never i haven't heard that perspective of 
yo, what if we just began like just putting seeds of positivity into the world and, and uh, providing by opportunity and, you know, all of this shit, things, I'm sorry, I'm, yeah. Um, but like, it's something that is missing. I don't know, it just really touched me. But I think that that's what is gonna get, you know, I, yeah. I think. Oh. Yeah. No, we, we totally catch the vibes. We're all homies here. And like, you know what I mean? Like we, we catch the vibes. It's like, it's, it's about us being together. It's about community and being like, yo, bro, we see eye to eye together. It's like, we all do. It's like, and we care about each other and we want the best for the world, you know, and being able to have that, you know, interconnectivity of a group of people that can do that together and accomplish that goal. So, you know, that's what this is all about. And that's, and that's really what it is. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy that we can all, be here and do this i think we might have time for maybe one more question if anyone has anything um, yeah i i have a sorry um i have a question again thank you so much for doing this but i have a question kind of going back to the very first thing that you mentioned dr goff um about ha we're having these issues and and the realization of these problems now because we didn't have these or the generations before us didn't have these conversations um in like a sit a face-to-face -face conversation about these issues and how to solve them and um, a lot of the barriers and limitations that we face today and in, in sort of the systemic change to make the world a better place for future generations is that immutable mindset that a lot of our older, a lot older, a lot of the population of the older generation um, has. And my question is, um, like with the shift to social media, the activist shift to social media, um, the, the very big wave of uh, social media activism that occurred um, over the summer, um, something that I've had multiple conversations with uh, my friends is that we're not really reaching new ears, new eyes. It's the same information that, that's being circulated um, to the same people um, on social media. And um, the thing is, the most important people, the people that we need to change, the people whose mindsets need to change and who are acting as barriers to um, the positive change that we seek, they're not on social media and they won't listen as much to us um, and we don't exactly have that direct access to them um, so my question is how do we reach these people and how do we touch them effectively um, to really enact change in the world it's a, it's a great question um, uh, you know I, I hear what you're saying that um, some of the folks that you that you want to talk to they're, they're not following you on Twitter Right, they don't they don't view your Instagram stories, um, and so how how the hell are you supposed to talk to them? And under COVID, that's an even better question, right? Because you can't go and visit. Um, but I want to I want to tie your question back to Tomosha. What Tomosha was trying to say about love and the and and the vibe that, that we're all catching on this is sometimes sometimes they'll listen when you win. Sometimes they'll listen when you have the power to change the policies. So I just, I just want to be really clear. Um, if we're talking about um, folks in my generation, my parents' generation, my grandparents who were, you know, that generation when they're still around, um, they agree or they disagree, but I guarantee you they heard what Black Lives Matter is now. Mm -hmm. And they may think that police abolition is this crazy lunacy. Wait five years. See what happens in policies, right? For those who think that climate change is not, um, uh, you know, made from humans, right? I would love to convince them because the world is a better place when we can rely on science. But if I can't convince them, I'd like us all to live in a world where the temperature is going down. So if we want a, a vibe of love and positivity and community um, uh, to rule, one of the things we have to take seriously is that is very difficult given the human condition under contexts of scarcity. When I don't have enough, it's hard for me to feel like I can give to somebody else. But when I know we're all going to have enough, it's way easier for me to take risks. This is the reason why a social safety net is necessary for business risks. It's also the reason why you don't have a problem dancing and singing foolishly in karaoke when you're with your friends. But the thought of getting on stage full of uh, front of stage strangers is terrifying to people. So if we're thinking about how do we get there, 
Some of it is is creating those uh, relationships, seeking them out. Like those folks who aren't on Twitter or on Facebook, you can find them if you're dedicated to doing that. But some of this is just about making the world, taking your power, making the world be the way you need it to be. And you have a different conversation when you have created a better world for everybody. Folks who didn't agree with you before, who hated who hated uh, healthcare the way it was trying to get out, but now they've got healthcare. They don't hate those pro- programs of healthcare anymore. So don't 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 worry sometimes so much about who you're not reaching with your words. Your actions, if you do them right, will ripple far far further. Oh. Oh, um, I can add in too. I think one of like the best parts of that idea is that this next vision won't be imaginable either until someone goes in and does it. Uh, until you have people like Dr. Goff that start actually implementing solutions and then they can point to them and say, look, but this works and you can't even dispute that. Is this idea right? That the people in the middle ages didn't think of themselves as being in the middle of anything. Uh, right? I, it's very much the same position Right now, we can't imagine something going beyond civilization that we have. Uh, and I thought Dr. Goff did a great job of speaking to just how we bring that into existence, just one idea at a time. One conversation at a time. It all starts with education too, and just establishing that connection. Even if we are in a virtual world, there is a type of way that we can connect with each other virtually, create virtual spaces, and you know, tell our story and create action through that 100 percent. i just want to say thank you to everybody here and for coming into having this amazing conversation with us also just want to say thank you to dr goff for being here and educating all of us through our journeys of understanding of trying to you know navigate this crazy world and just like you said this virtual conversation that we're having i would love to uh take a virtual selfie with you guys if that's possible um and i also just want to say big shout out to airbnb for hosting this conversation we really really appreciate this and yeah so we're going to take a quick virtual selfie one time guys um if everybody can just give me your best selfie you know what i'm saying boom thank you guys for being here rock and roll lives <laughs> And thank you guys so much, Dr. Goff. Once again, I will be in communication with you and everybody. Thank you so much for signing on to this. And we really appreciate you. And Airbnb, thank you so much. And until next time, guys, I hope you all have an amazing day. And yeah, thank you for having this conversation. Thank you so much. Such a privilege. Thank you, Jaden. Thank you.